Welcome to Minor Details. I'm Nick. And I'm James. And we are two industrial designers in the big city. Sweating the small stuff. Woo! We got some exciting, exciting updates, weekly updates this week, James. Oh my gosh. I mean, if you aren't watching the video, we are in the new studio space. It is awesome. You can probably hear it. Honestly, there's not a soft surface in this room, so it's probably going to sound a little bit different, but bear with us. We'll, we'll fine tune it as we go. But we've got all this fancy new equipment, <laughs> We Nick. also, yes, we also splurged. We got some nice uh, podcasting mics with like serious cable cords. Ooh. These are That's the technical term. You can search it up on Amazon, cable <laughs> cords, um, into this black box, which does magical things and it has a bunch of knobs on it. Yeah. What um, would you say the diameter of this cord is? Oh, that's what? a good uh, six millimeters. I, I was going to say a hundred. A hundred millimeters. Yeah. It's huge. <laughs> For those, yes. It's a hundred millimeters <laughs> diameter uh, cord. It's about as thick as a, uh, a, a coffee cup. <laughs> Um, also, uh, we had to turn off the AC so that this audio quality yeah. sounds delicious. We are literally going to be sweating the small it, stuff it, in here. It is already getting kind of a little toasty. Um, but yes, yeah, so we have an ice cube melting in the corner over here. It's a sculpture of Nick and I doing the podcast together. Check that out in the video. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I'm excited cause because I guess this is kind of the first debut of the new studio. I'm excited I, because... I my shelves up in the yeah, background. I'm excited because we're no longer recording in Nick's filthy, stinking <laughs> it's, bedroom. It's Well, I don't want to say it's stinking <laughs> or filthy, but it is nice to be out of the bedroom just because it looks like an insane asylum in there mm-hmm. with all the foam padding on the walls. Yeah. And it'll be nice to take that down. Did you take down. all that down? I, well, I will eventually. I will yeah. eventually. Um, yeah. Every time I have someone over my house, they look at my room and they're like, you know, I actually had to go. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, but yeah. So nice. That's the, the the news on my end. Oh man. It's so exciting to be in here, but yeah. You got some updates too, James. I've got, I've got a, a bit of, a bit of updates. Uh, Andrew Brace and I, um, we released the first episode of Brace Makes. So this is his series. Andrew Brace is a, uh, he's a prototyper. He makes a lot of looks like models he has throughout his career. He's also a trained industrial designer. Uh, He worked for Quirky. He's worked for uh, himself as well, doing doing prototyping. I met him um, because of the Peloton dumbbell that I did. He did a looks like model of that. Um, and after he did that, I was so impressed with that. I, I said to him, I want to do something like, I want you to make one of my helicopters. And he had this idea of making this series of, of how to prototype like a YouTube series. Yeah. Um, and so he, another connection that we have is that we also both have worked at the FIT. He's currently working for the FIT toy design program. Oh, okay. Uh, teaching As kids how to do model model making, okay. model awesome. shop stuff. That's cool. Um, so yeah, super talented dude. Um, but yeah, so he's he's devised this series. He's going to be working with different designers, but the first part of the series is is me, and we're going through this this process of of taking the helicopter. And this is your little helicopter design. You did yeah. it a while back. Um, and then there's also the animation that, uh, Derek Elliott, Derek Elliott did. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, the first, the first episode of brace makes it's the whole idea is to go from the super, super simple. Like what can you do with materials that you have around your house? Right. Uh, and then it's going to get all the way up to looks like prototypes. Ooh, that'll be fun. And does it, is it going to function too? I mean, you could probably make your helicopter spin, right? I, th- I, I mean, I imagine, I think that Andrew Brace can do just about anything. Yeah. So brace yourself. <laughs> oh boy. You got to throw that pun in there. <laughs> but, no, but I, I watched the first episode, James, I thought, James, I thought it was really cool. Um, you guys just made 2d cardboard, uh, I guess, I don't know, like standing cardboard, one-to-one scale models of this helicopter and it was really simple yeah but you know what was cool is when i was watching the video uh andrew talks about his cutting technique mm. uh, for cutting cardboard and you know my technique is just take an exacto knife and make sure that blade's sharp and just <laughs> just go at it you know zorro style exactly yeah uh, 
but no, there was a really interesting technique that Andrew talked about where it was almost like he, he didn't curve the knife. He just kind of made a lot of tiny little cuts around. Yeah. If it was, you know, around a, a circular edge, it's just like almost making instead of a circle, just making like a octagon or a, or a de- decagon. Yeah. Well, it's like, it's, it, if you can remember back to ninth grade geometry, right. it's like all the tangent lines that make up the outside of a circle. Right. If you make enough of those lines, it's a perfect circle. Exactly. And so, uh, Andrew also, uh, launched this, you know, this website, I, I think it might've been part of his original website, but he's, he's launched these deep dives into every episode where he goes through oh, you got the materials, you got the timing. Yeah. That's and, cool. And he even, he even made this little oh, diagram the of, of the it. cutting corners yes. uh, technique. And so I really recommend that if you go and check out the video, also check out the, the website because it, it really does dive into the whole process and what we, what the result was. And it's, so that's at andrewbrace.com. Yeah, andrewbrace.com. And so, yeah, I mean, the whole point of this, and I had never used this method before. It's just slotting, you know, your front view and side view together to make this 2D, 3D, he calls it 2.5D yeah. model. And it's like, gives you such a sense of scale immediately right. in a way that, you know, it would take too long to get the full 3D model together to get that sense or like, you know, I've done it before where you just print out the 2D drawing and that doesn't give you enough information really. And so I felt like this is really awesome, valuable model making technique. And that was the thing is like, you look around our community itself, like industrial design, and there's not a lot of people putting together resources for model making. Yeah. You know, there's plenty of sketching tutorials. There's plenty of rendering tutorials, right. but not a lot when it comes to models. Yes. Yeah, so this is awesome. So yeah, I'm, I'm super excited. I'm excited to see this helicopter come to life, man. Yeah. When's the next episode coming out? Can you tease that or no? Uh, I think in look out for it in the next couple of weeks. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Um, you know, they take, they take time to put together and I have to give it to Andrew. He's done. He took an hour's worth of footage and boiled it down to 12 minutes, which is an art form and a labor of love. Video editing, man, that could suck up some yeah. time for sure. Um, I believe it. So yeah. Uh, but check it out. Uh, we'll put a link on the website and everything. Oh yeah. Also shoe correction. Yep. You have a shoe correction, James. I have a shoe correction. Okay. Okay, so I made a mistake, Nick. It's fine, James. I'm, we make mistakes all the time. Listen, it's okay. <laughs> I am a mistake maker. It's good to correct them, though. It is good to correct but them. Don't be so hard on yourself. We're going to make mistakes. Yes, we are going to make mistakes. And this is a case where I should have done a bit more research to make sure that I knew what I was talking about when I was talking about my new shoes, my Hirachi oh, from edges. last week. From last yeah, week. Okay, from yes. two weeks ago. We well, last episode. Last yeah, episode. last episode. Right. So uh, I attributed them to Heron Preston. Right, the fashion designer. Because I guess when I had done the research, when I looked them up, he had done some colorways on the Hirachi Edge. Okay. But it was not him that created the original design. Ah, uh, I see. Okay. And so um, Austin Powers, Sketch Powers, yeah. uh, works at Nike, and he messaged me and was like, hey, man, so... Heron didn't design those. The guy who designed them, his name is Lee Gibson. Oh, uh, okay. And so... Um, I, I'm, that's kind of weird. Do you ever think about that, how these fashion designers come into these big shoe companies and say, hey, I'll throw some new colors on it and call it my design? It's crazy. Because you wouldn't... I would never... like. That doesn't happen really in any other product line. Right. You're not, like, you can't like make a, a, a blue MacBook and say, hey, look, I designed this MacBook. Yeah. Although I guess, well, it's, it's sort of different. It's like the charity edition, but all the red products, yeah. like those are kind of like charity. But yeah, I, I don't think Heron Preston would be like, yo, I want to do a colorway of those KitchenAid self-leveling <laughs> measuring spoons. I, mean, um, I guess if you're famous enough, you could do that. Probably. I don't know. That's but, interesting. But uh, but I do want to apologize and also compliment Lee Gibson on a stellar shoe design. Yeah. Because I do love my Hirachi edges. Um, so anyway, that, um, was, that was a correction that had to be made. That's good. Corrections are good. Yes. Also, buy a pin, guys. <laughs> 
Yes, correct the mistake that you have made in not buying a pin. Uh, yeah, we sold a few, um, and we have a few more left. So if you'd like to support the podcast, buy a pin. It's a great way to support the podcast, and it looks cool. It, it, it does look cool. It's a little asterisk. There's, there's all sorts asterisk. of cool people walking around with these on their backpacks. There's us. There's, there's Dave Joseph. Yeah. I saw a story with, with Dave with his pin on his backpack. I, that's all that we know for sure. But that, that other is people. all that we know for now. <laughs> But uh, but yes, for the price of a Chipotle burrito plus guacamole plus a drink, yes, you can support this podcast and get Nick a new pair of socks. That's right. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Um, micro details too. We got. Oh we gotta, yeah. You guys mm. really loved that one time we did micro details, and so we're bringing it back. We got a new micro detail for you guys, and that micro detail is parting lines and joining lines and reveals and what are these things i'm saying how are you going to explain it to people that have no clue what this stuff is right so i made a post yeah. about uh i guess so june 30th i made a post so recently we have cracked out the n64 in my household uh my wife allison had one had kept one in mint condition nice um one of the reasons i married my wife is because of how how she treated her electronics. Oh, really? She, she was very, very good about like taking batteries out of things. That's impressive. And, like she, all of all, like she still has her N64, her GameCube, all this stuff. Wow. Okay. So breaking out the N64 controllers. And first of all, I've always loved the N64 controller because it's such a weirdo. Like it's, it's unlike any other controller right. that's ever been this made the one for a major three console. Handles, right? It's the Trident. The Trident. Yeah. Um, and I love it because I, I love when you're using the control stick. Like your hand kind of like, you know, fits into this little groove. Right. And, and you kind of can have a loose grip on it and, and it won't fall. Right. It's you know? just kind of like sitting in your hand. Yeah. It's nice. It, it just nests. But the th the thing is, is like, as it's sitting there not being used, I just look at the controller. And the thing that I don't think I ever registered before, maybe I did, but I wasn't thinking about it, was the split line. Right. So where the two halves of the controller come together. Right. And this is very common on a lot of plastic objects. You have kind of these two shells where, where the shells meet. Yeah. There's this gap. Right. In the plastic. Yeah. And uh, it made me think about the consumer and made me think about how many consumers are really registering this, this split line. Right. And, but the thing was, is that originally I called it a parting line and that was incorrect. Yes. Parting lines are different from split lines part. Yeah. So uh, I'm, I made that mistake. I'm as, as I've said before, as we've stated previously in James, the previous you're really segment, go, you're really going hard on I'm yourself. A, today. I'm a mistake man. <laughs> um, but, uh, Somebody commented um, and asked, they were like, isn't, isn't that a split line? And I was like, oh, shucks, that, I need to make that correction. But then the cool thing that happened was after, after that mistake, um, Lucas, uh, Lucas Koto, Co I've never pronounced your last name before. That's fine. C Lucas Koto, he's actually a co-founder of Weekly Design Challenge, mm -hmm. he put together this post uh, explaining the differences between parting lines and split, split lines, lines. Right. Which I thought was really cool. It's a nice way to visualize it. You know, you have the the, the parting line. So, you, so like we said, we have this two shell construction where you have a top plastic piece, a bottom plastic piece. They come together and they create a gap and that's called the split line. Yeah. Now, if you take those pieces away and you have just the top piece yeah that top piece is actually formed by two mold halves that come right. you know from the top and the bottom of the piece and where those molds meet is the parting line mm -hmm. and the parting line is much smaller you can you don't see it as much yeah it's a very like thin little like edge right. on the plastic face if it's done well if the mold isn't terrible right then you'll like you'll just see invisible. a small line i mean on apple products i don't know how they do it they like polish it out or something no it's it's crazy but i mean you will sometimes see if a parting line is like 
is is too proud of the product it will kind of like gunk up over time yeah like you will start to see it it will kind of emerge over time but the great thing that that lucas did was he broke down the different types of split lines and right. parting lines and which one and like their their pros and cons right and like you know one, one of the things that he points out that like if you have a fillet on an edge then you can put the parting line on the top of that fillet and it will kind of hide the parting line right and it also kind of curves under a little bit and also make for a nicer split line like a split line that's not so sharp right because you know sometimes if if the molds like if the design is just to an edge then you will potentially get a pretty sharp right. split line and that's not very nice to hold in your hand no and then the other one that i that i always see and you can definitely see it in a lot of like electronic parts i think about a lot of more i guess lesser less expensive products i think mm-hmm. have this one and this one's the gap yeah where you kind of make an intent an intentional gap on the part the split line so that it it hides any like discrepancy where the two pieces come together right. because a lot of the times these pieces are coming together with like screws or glue and there can be kind of some like waviness to where yeah. the two halves come together. Yeah. So if you make an intentional gap, it kind of like hides it underneath that gap. Right. Yeah. It's, it's more, I mean, I feel like it's kind of leaning into the idea that there's going to be a split there and why not just kind of embrace it right? rather than like, you're never going to make a really like, unless you're Apple, right. you got <laughs> that control over your factories. Like right. you're never going to make that seamless split. Yeah. Speaking of Apple, should we get to the, Oh, we should get to that news. We'll, we'll post some of these images too. So you guys can check out this, this super micro detail. But yeah. Yeah. We, we and, just wanted to nerd we'll, out over it. Yeah. And we'll link to the post as well. And, and shout out to Lucas for putting that together. That's like, I, I, sometimes I feel like we are, we are in the process in on Instagram of putting together a textbook on industrial design. <laughs> and, and this is, a, this is a great, a great addition to that textbook. Yeah. That's true. Um, but, okay, so there's big news. Well, the funny thing is, is that last episode, we recorded like two hours before the news broke. Yeah. And the news is is that our our beloved father, Johnny Ive, has <laughs> left Apple. He's, he's left Apple. He's gone. I mean, not yet. He's leaving. He, he is, He's announced his resignation. Yeah. Which is, I don't know. I, how do you feel about it? Because I miss him so much already. <laughs> Well, we know that he started flirting with that gorgeous Australian, Mark Newson. Right. So, and so they're going to go off and form their own little consultancy is the Yeah. is what the news has said. But I mean, something that was that I didn't realize and this is how little I know about the structure of Apple is that Johnny was kind of overseeing all of design right both at, at the end both software and hardware and that there is a like a, a chief industrial designer right there's a vp of design vp of design yes um so you know in my mind i was like oh my gosh who's gonna step in to fill in johnny's shoes and it's like are they gonna put anybody in there like to know. do that role again i mean you know he was the first one who invented that role there was not a chief design officer before johnny ive yeah and once he coined himself as cdo it started to spread and you know there's other there's other people that are now in cdo positions as well right but there is a head of vp um or a vp of design at apple yeah um, who you know from what i've read kind of was already running the show a good bit um and yeah, I, you'll have to look it up who it is. I'm I'm looking it up currently. Or or we can just say that there is one. But um. Oh yeah, Evans Evans Hankey, right? Right. Um, um. And female industrial designer. When I saw the name Evans, I was like, Oh, who's was, this dude? Thought it was a guy. <laughs> no, you you look it up and no. I she's... mean, it's. I I have to say, I do think it's pretty cool that the the VP of design at Apple and the VP of design at Google are both women. Yeah. Like that's that's, that's awesome. not something that you expect in sort of the Silicon Valley tech world. Um, She's been with Apple a long time too, I think. Yeah. Um, you know what's funny? As I was looking up, Johnny Ive has been at Apple bef- since before I was born. I, the, my reaction to it was like, I had never thought that 
Johnny Ive would leave. I never, I never could think about that. Right. I just thought he was like part of Apple and either Apple would die or he would die. Yeah. And it never crossed my mind that, Hey, he might leave one day. I don't I know. know. I was, I, 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 I miss him and I don't know what to think about it. I just, oh, man, it's yeah. so, it's so kind of crazy. Yeah. I am excited to see what Johnny, Johnny and Mark do their, their new consultancy consultancy is called love from, I believe. Yeah. Um, so that'll be interesting. I am I'm very excited about that partnership because I I'm a huge Mark Newson fan. Yeah. I think he is he's easily one of my favorite designers. I think there are there are people out there that I don't know, like I love and I was talking to you about this the other day that I love that Mark Newson's vision of the future is a very like friendly, like j- almost Jetsons like yes. vision of the future. It's very soft. There's a lot more softness in Mark Newson's future and future vision. I As I a, love I love that aesthetic. There's a lot of futures out there that are a lot more dystopian. I th- feel yeah, his is much more optimistic. Yeah, and uh, and so I'm really excited to see what they do together. And then I'm also interested to see what happens at Apple. Yeah, now that now that Johnny's gone, like. I think this is a this is a good breakup. I think it's going to benefit both parties in a lot of ways. You know what happened? You know what happened is everyone got so mad about the cheese grater, and Johnny <laughs> said, "I'm done. I try to make good design, and everyone just makes fun of me." So yeah, that's well, what happened, and I am so mad, you guys. I can't believe you guys <laughs> did that to him. Johnny slid into my DMs and said, "I hope you're happy now, you little sh." Dang it, James. Yeah, Dang it. I know it's all my fault. Um, but anyway, I'm, I'm interested to see what happens. I think either, uh, like either party is set up for success. Yeah. Maybe this is what we need. We need a little, little shake up in the industry. I was really interested. Like when I was thinking about like who could come in and take over. Oh, I thought I, you were saying who could come into our podcast. And- no, I was thinking about who could come in and take over Apple's design. And I was, you know, I just sort of thinking about like all of the, San Francisco designers and like how they might fit into that role and lead Apple into an interesting new direction. Right. Cause it's like, you know, what if Isbahar went to Apple? Like what if he was the chief designer? I don't know how I feel about that. (laughs) I don't know if I like that. I think that would be pretty cool. Like I, I just, you know, I wonder if just, I mean, John, Johnny Ive was somebody that was essentially promoted within the organization. Yes. Like he was working there before Steve Jobs came back and Steve Jobs saw potential in his work. Right. And, and so, you know, maybe that's the case again. Maybe Evans is going to, now that she doesn't have, you know, the, the shadow of Johnny above her, she's going to kind of like really that's spread a, her wings. That's interesting. So I'm interested I'm watching. I yeah. I'm watching you guys. <laughs> oh man, no, that's that's a. I I don't know how I feel about it yet. Yeah. Um. So, the topic this week maybe kind of echoes what we we're talking about with micro details a little bit, but um. Yeah. We were thinking about, you know, as designers, we see value and beauty in design, but customers or consumers see value and beauty in a different way. Right. At least that's the idea. And I don't know, we wanted to just kind of discuss that and think about it and see if there was something there. Yeah. Yeah. It's something that I've been thinking about for a while because, you know, there's sort of the, the industrial designer or even architects, just designers in general, there's like a way that we see beauty and like, when we walk into a room, maybe we're analyzing it in a different way. And when we see like the, the optimal like designers like habitat and we're, we're just like, Oh, that's, you know, it's like nice and clean and, and, you know, nice lines and everything is, is just so. And, you know, then you go and you visit your parents' house (laughs) and you're like, you know, the thing is, is that, there's a lot of comfort there. There's a lot of, there's like, yeah, they got, the, they got the lazy boys out. You know? Well, not that kind of comfort. What I'm saying, <laughs> my parents got lazy boys. Well, out. <laughs> yeah, but you know, what I'm saying is, is that like, at least, you know, I, I would say of, of like 
the tastes of my parents, or at least my mom, I think it's more of like that farmhouse aesthetic. Oh, does she have the like the rustic wood uh, panel that has the script painted that no, says no, home no. is where the oh, heart is? You know what I'm talking that's about? That's my least favorite part about Joanna Gaines. It, does she shop at Hobby Lobby? I don't know about that. My mom loves Hobby Lobby. My mom gets really, like, I mean, the, she gets super nicely made furniture, but it's sort of like the spindly kind of leg. Traditional, traditional very furniture. Very traditional yeah. furniture. And... Same, same with my parents. Yeah. And, it, and you know, I do sometimes, like, thinking about the designs, the furniture designs that Dita Rams did for Vitso. And it's like, I can't imagine this anywhere else than an office I can, place. I can't imagine it anywhere else except for in Dita Rams' house. Yeah. No, I'm just kidding. I think, and, I think the, the, the Vitso shelves, shelving is really nice. But uh, actually, I want to I wanna go on a contrary there because I think with the Vitso shelving, which is just very simple, like panel what's the track shelving i'm not uh-huh. exactly sure the technical term for it you just have a metal poles and then you attach the shelves to the metal poles um i've you know i i've seen the vitso catalog and everything i feel like that design is so um, simple and o- almost transparent that it really forms to whatever space you have like, I feel like whatever you put onto the shelf creates mm-hmm. the shelf. Yeah. Now, I agree that maybe it's not going to fit into your parents' house. Yeah. But I think it could fit into a wide range of homes. Maybe. I, th- I think that what it ends up looking like and what a lot of designer stuff ends up looking like is, is very clinical. Mm. It's very, like, That's office true. space and not so much, like, home sweet home. Yeah. You know? And why is that? I, I'm not sure. I, I don't know if maybe we're so in love with the process that like the, the, the industrial process that we don't get caught up in that rather than like making something feel homey. Yeah. Like the only sort of, you know, modern designers that I can think of that make things that I would truly want to like fill my home with is like Hans Wegner yeah. And the Eames. Yeah. Like, I feel like the Eames and, and a lot of, and I would say a lot of Scandinavian design. I feel like there's a lot of... Do you think of, it's wood? Do you I think it's... I think that's part of it. But I also think material? that it's a form language. I think it's a form language that, like, all of the Eames stuff, regardless of how much padding it actually has, it feels comfortable. I feel like we're diving into something a little deeper. I, I, I like this. I, I feel like maybe... People like forms that are curvy because it feels like it's less harsh. Right. Right? Yeah. I mean, that. Like, I feel like people... Same with materials. Right. Like metal is harsh in your mind. Yes. And wood is more soft. Yes. I think so. But I, I mean, you can make... You can make metal, you can cast metal to, right. to feel softer. Right. You know, it's it's not necessarily... Because, like, the, the other thing that you will find in homes, especially, like, patio furniture, is, like, the bent the bent steel rod, but it's bent in that way that kind of looks right. like that farmhouse feel. Right. And maybe, like, it works there because it's outdoors and you feel like this is reliably going to stand the test of time. Right. But... You know, the the general vibe, I feel like, is that when you come home, you want your home to be warm and comfortable. And relaxing. And, yeah. And I just, I sometimes feel like we are making, especially now, I feel like the, the general vibe is to make really simple geometries. And... We are in this, like, geometry trend right now. Yeah. the These simple geometries that just, like... And and it's mostly about a CMF exploration. Yeah. And I'm I'm wondering if it's really what people want to fill their homes with. I mean, I can see wanting to have certain kind of items that are very streamlined, very, you know, true to the process in the workplace. Like I right. think I think the seems w- efficient. Yes, exactly. Do you think here here's a thought. Do uh-huh. you think maybe this is more of a uh generational thing? Because mm. I think about how as uh we'll throw out the word millennial. As yeah. a millennial, I feel like, you know, my room is very clinical. It's very like you know, simple, 
you know, boxes and very geometric shapes. Uh huh. Whereas my parents had the very like, you know, comfy couches and things. Do you think that maybe some of that has to do with working from home? Since a lot of millennials are now working from home, they have more utility yeah. in their home from that aspect? I think so. And I think the other thing that millennials do is they bring a lot of plant life into their home, which yeah. I also feel like softens it, makes it more of a home space. For sure. But I do think that you're on to something when it comes to people working from home. And so there is this mix of home and work aesthetics. Yeah that are i think they are different aesthetics and and yeah one speaks to efficiency and one speaks to comfort hmm. um i also feel like and this is diving way deeper and i'm not sure that i have enough to back this idea up but i also feel like our generation and maybe the generation right before us gen x is also a very cynical generation and also very like cynical about tradition and in this way that we are very dismissive of tradition and we kind of want to find our own way. Right. And so I think that that's why a lot of our generation, it's like you don't want decorative things. Like you don't want superfluous things because it feels disingenuous. It feels like, it's not honest. Right. And we're so obsessed with authenticity and honesty that mm. I wonder if like the fact that, you know, like maybe we're not into farmhouse furniture because we're not living on the farm. Exactly. That's and, interesting. Huh? But, but at the same time, I don't know that if we're purchasing things that are actually giving us any happiness, any comfort, right. Any, I actually think we're swinging back a little bit. I think we're starting to swing back. Mm. You know, uh, I mean, if you look at Ikea, they've done a lot of more recent like maximalist, maximalism type right. of products where they are more decorative. Like I believe if I can recall, Ikea made like bookends that look like dogs or something like that. Really? <laughs> like it's just like a, a sculpture of a dog, which is very against the grain for Ikea. Right. And I know they just released kind of this more of... Um, I like more millennial focused kind of furniture that I guess moves with you when you move your apartment. Yeah. Um, I don't I don't think that one was it. Is that, is this not it? Uh, maybe it wasn't. I love it. Maybe it wasn't I, a dog. It says, I love this Ikea hack. There, there was one, there's one Ikea product that is very like detailed and it looks like a sculpture of a dog. Yeah. Um, but I feel like we are maybe lacking a little bit of that. Um, and I think, I think it's going to swing. I think the other thing that, that goes into it is like, it, and I think this is a big part of, of the decisions that get made at companies, is because you're investing so much into products and you're trying to reach this big market, right? like you're going to either go for things that have been successful in the past, right? or you're going to go for the thing that is the least costly to make because you know if it doesn't work out or like least costly and kind of bland right like it's not polarizing yeah if it, you start at, if you make a sculpture of a dog obviously people who don't like dogs are not going to buy it right it's a polarizing thing you could just make a metal book in that was a square yeah and and i i miss like there are designers who are still doing things from a very distinct point of view but it's like looking at products from the 90s it's like everything has this really distinct point of view. Yeah. And it's like, I kind of miss that. Like well, there's, there's like a risk 30 in that. Year, 30 year trend. Man. I know. 90s are coming back. I know. Like, you know, recently coming in contact with somebody like Scott Henderson, who does this work that is very, like, it's very much from his point of view, at, but it's also appeals to a broader audience. Yeah. Like I, that's the kind of design that I want to strive for. And I feel like, you know, we've kind of gotten into this mode of like, oh, like, you know, we need to appeal to this broader audience and like, what is good design to the world? Yeah. And, and that just feels like the wrong approach to me. It's like, but I think like, how, like I, making a product that appeals to 7 billion people yeah. is going to be the, 
it's just going to be like a sphere. Right. And no one wants, <laughs> no, what are you going to do with a sphere? Yeah. Or a cube, you know? I don't, you yeah. Know? So, so maybe a, this is kind of a tangent or like yeah. a separate, uh, a idea, but, uh, you know, in terms of like what designers think is beautiful versus consumers, mm. I think consumers are, and you were talking about this a little bit, very function driven. Yeah. And, you know, they, they want something to work first and foremost. Right. So when there's maybe something that is more aesthetically pleasing, but works a little bit less, you know, for example, the, the juicy Salif by, uh, Mar- Phil- uh, Philippe Stark, F- Philippe Stark. I almost said Mark Newson <laughs> where, it, where it still juices, but it's less functional than your average KitchenAid. Yeah. And consumers, you know, probably would buy the KitchenAid thing if they didn't know much about design. Right. Absolutely. And one thing too, I was thinking about is, well, and I don't know, maybe we could talk about that or not, but, um, I was looking on Amazon at some of my reviews for some of the products I've designed. Oh no. Like a lot of pet products and all this stuff. And yeah. you've done this too, right? Oh, I have. It's a fun thing to like, look up what people think about your product. Right. And it's, it's interesting to me because, um, so I've designed this cat toy. It's like a loopy ball thing. Should I, should I look it up? Uh, yeah, you can look it up on Amazon. Yeah. Jackson. It's called the Jackson galaxy satellite satellites cat toy. Um, I've mentioned it before. I'm sure on the podcast, 89 customer reviews. I, I honestly, 4.2 stars. I, I am really proud of this product. I, I have, I have a proposal to make, uh, yes. I'll let you finish. Okay. I'm going to let you finish. Okay. Um, but, uh, <laughs> I'm going to let you finish, but yeah. here's my, st- <laughs> but I want, I want to start putting, you know how people will t- like do like red dot, like yeah. IDA. I want to put like Amazon. 4.5 out of five stars on Amazon. That 89 is nine reviews. That is way more commendable than, than a red dot. In right. my opinion, I I'm not the biggest fan of the red dot award. Yeah. But, um, Anyways, it's funny to look at the reviews and read them because, you know, a lot of them, on, on specifically on this one, a lot of them were really positive. Yeah. Cats love this toy. It's like light. They can bat it around. Uh, it's kind of like springy. You know, yeah. it, it can kind of flex. You can put treats in it. it. There's a lot of things you can do with it. Um, but it's funny because the exact opposite can happen where a consumer doesn't quite understand the design intent. Right. So I made this thing and it's a squiggly ball and it doesn't, it's not a perfect sphere. It rolls and it wobbles and it doesn't roll very far before yeah. it stops and hits Let's the see side. That. Let's see that one, those one star reviews. I think this is the one I was referring to, right? Uh, Dangerous for my cats. Yeah. Maybe you want to read it. Okay. Unsure of the positive reviews because these are the cheapest, flimsiest overpriced excuse for a cat toy <laughs> I've bought. They aren't round like a ball, more like a square, so they can't roll, and cats can't bat them because they don't roll. Material is not sturdy for animal play. I accidentally stepped on one, and it was squished. I'm 105 pounds. (laughs) Good for you, Ryan. Way to keep that weight down. It's easy to pull apart, see photo, and I do question the safety factor for pets. There are wide open spaces where cat's paws got stuck inside not to mention one had a swollen lip when it got caught in his teeth and i tried to take it out luckily i heard the ruckus i'm shocked jackson galaxy would actually endorse this product as it's his name that prompted me to buy these don't waste your money Thank you, Ryan. That was a beautiful, beautiful comment. Yeah. Ryan um, at, at Ryan at a, a lean 105 pounds can still fit in his prom tux. I just, I thought it was really interesting because the, there was a lot of points that he made that were just, we're, we're just not understanding the design intent. Right. right. Like it's not supposed to roll around. It's supposed to wobble. It's supposed to kind of act like a mouse, like jutting back and forth. Yeah. It's not a perfect roll. Right. Um, and then it is flimsy so that you can put treats in it or, yeah. or the cats can grab it with their mouth. It's like he's actually listing all of the, f- the functions. Right. And then saying, <laughs> and saying like, what the heck is this? Right. So it's just like interesting how people can view your designs in a, a completely different context yeah. and see them in a different light than what you intended. That's hilarious. Um, yeah. I, uh, let's see. We should start putting Amazon reviews on our, uh, like 
on our portfolios or something. I w- absolutely we should. I do you have any bad reviews? Let's for see. Your bag so clip? the bag clip has ninety nine customer reviews and four point four stars. Oh, you beat me. Four point four. Um, and let's see. Let's get a one star in here. Okay, weak springs fell apart. Oh no. The clips we received are very weak as far as clamping force. <laughs> Technical term. Yes, absolutely. This 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 person, Fuzzbean, must be some sort of scientist or engineer, at least. Structural, probably. Then, one of the two clips already fell apart after hardly any use. Then, uh, the pin fell out. Oh, man, this thing's falling apart. I was able to reinsert the pin only because there was almost zero initial tension on the springs. But I expect it will fall right back out very soon. <laughs> this guy's definitely like an engineer or something. Yeah. There is nothing holding it in place, despite one end being knurled. Okay, because definitely. The, if you know what knurling is, yeah. normal Amazon reviews don't have knurling. I don't know who Fuzzbean is, but probably should have had them check the drawings before we sent them out. <laughs> because the plastic ear it passes through is so thin. They should have used a rivet for the pivot instead of a straight headless pin. Too bad because the secondary use of hanging papers on the fr- because the secondary use of hanging papers on the fridge made possible by the added magnet is a good idea. Oh well, it props oh. to the magnet. Props yeah. to the magnet. I mean, that's it's a pretty standard design. That's to have a that's magnets a f- on the back of bag clips. Well, guys, send us an email. Send us a, a note. Let us know what you guys think about this segment that we're or, calling. We review Amazon or we read bad Amazon reviews of our products. What or how about we ask people to send in reviews. Their one star review on their own products. On their own products. I like that. We should do that. Send too. it into minor details podcast at gmail.com or join the Discord and and maybe we should just have a have a new channel called Amazon Reviews. Yes. Yes. I love this. This yeah. is a fun little segment. Yeah. Um yeah, but I don't know. I thought that was a, a interesting topic around what we think is unique and beautiful and valuable versus consumers. Yeah. And Again, we want to hear what you think. Yeah. Let us know. Let us know. Um, there's a lot. There's a lot to that topic. So yeah. I imagine us revisiting parts of that in the future. For sure. Um, all right. So we have questions this week. If you had a question yourself, uh, my details podcast at gmail.com. And mm-hmm. then uh, voicemail. Again, no one's called in our voicemail in forever. So come on, you guys. know, if you guys want a question answered. You're you're pretty gonna you're pretty positive gonna get you're played. You're pretty gonna get played. Yes, English grammar. <laughs> um, so this question comes from Ryan Ryan Hume, and they ask, "Is the di- design industry shrinking or not?" Oh, let me let me rephrase that. Is the industrial design industry shrinking or not? Something else I've been wondering is if ID work is moving inland on as coastal agencies turn digital. Hmm. And I guess this is referring to the U.S. Yeah, that's super interesting. I mean, I think about San Francisco, obviously, is Silicon Valley, the hub of tech. Right. Everything is an app over there. Yeah. Um, I'd still think, and I, you know, this is interesting thought, is that industrial design in San Francisco, and from what I've heard, is like there are a lot of tech products, and a lot of times all you're doing is is just making a box to put Mm. electronics in it. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't know. I think the New York scene's a little bit more diverse than that. Right. But I think there is, you know, I I don't know if the design industry is shrinking or not, but I think there is something to the statement of, is it moving inland? Mm. Yeah, it's funny because I was just, so I was talking to my mom. She was on the airplane next to some guy who worked, you know, just outside of Philadelphia at some random company they make like sensors for houses and things or like pipes and he was like oh yeah we have a team of like 10 industrial designers and i was like 10 what i've never heard of this company before in my life and that like was it is it consumer facing product or i think just described sound very industrial i think it might be industry to industry yeah but I, i would have to check on it again but yeah it's like it's one of those things that I feel like there's actually a lot more places with industrial designers than anybody even knows about because like, 
for whatever reason, these places are not posting ads all the time right. about like new work. Well, there's a whole f- industry of industrial designers that is all business to business. Yeah. You know, a lot of times you don't see the business to business kind of products. But I do feel like there's definitely a lot of design, like industrial designers in like the Midwest region yeah. that are working for some of these bigger companies that like... I don't know. I just I, I came directly to New York right. after school and it seemed like it was an industrial design wasteland. Like it seemed like there was nothing going on. Yeah. At least like no jobs really. Well, and it's very competitive too. Yes, it is. But then like once I worked here for a while, Lifetime Brands got a reputation. That's uh, fix our hair time. Let's <laughs> fix our hair time. Uh, that's when I like uncovered the secret world of industrial design jobs in New York. Right. You got connected. You know, it's a, uh, it is a very weird industry in that way because I think you'll see like thousands of jobs for UX UI designers right. up, but it's very difficult to find those yeah. industrial design jobs. And, and I'm not exactly sure why the thought is, is that, that it's going inland. Is it just because tech jobs have so much money so that just pushes out the physical products? It might be. I mean, you know, by default, physical products have a lot more overhead. Like you can easily have a MacBook and create an iPhone app and that's it. Right. Where if you wanted to create, you know, a a chair, like you got to invest. Yeah. tens of thousands of dollars to manufacture that chair. Yeah. Does Fuse Project, do they do UX, UI? They must. I, I, yeah, it's, yeah, digital. They, they do all kinds of yeah, stuff. Yeah, they do everything. I mean, when they started out, they were just doing industrial. Right. But I mean, I, I think as any company like this expands, like the thing that you want as a designer when a client comes to you is basically to take control of every aspect of the project if you can. Right. Because that ensures that the vision is held. Yes. Because otherwise, you could design something for somebody that has terrible branding right you know like i was not to rag too hard but i was Uh looking at that jack's galaxy packaging and it's don't get me started it's rough listen (laughs) listen i i tried my hardest i did i've done as much as i could hey i'm I'm proud you did a great job 4.2 out of five stars good job no i I am really proud of a lot of the work i did at pet me yeah i mean that in and pet me was uh in texas like that is an inland Inland design, well, not a design company, but yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I think I think part of it does stem down to just cost because when right. you're when you're spending fifty thousand dollars to manufacture a product, it's a lot easier to say, hey, let's take up a, a cheap place in in Kansas and yeah. rent it out because New York, you're gonna spend up half your fifty thousand just in rent. It's yeah, it is it is expensive. It's definitely cheaper inland. And you can have the kind of facility that would facilitate 30 industrial designers. Right. You know, I do want to just give another, I guess, uh, opinion slash suggestion slash, uh, I, I don't know. I, a lot of times students ask like, how do you get a job in New York? How do you get a job mm. in San Francisco? Whatever like that. I, you know, I went the route of getting that job in Texas, getting that job where I knew that. I wasn't going to have many design connections. I knew that, that there wasn't going to be a big community there right. and I knew I'd miss it. But I think there was a, just a lot of value in going out and getting that first industrial design job instead of trying over and over to figure out something in New York city. Right. And we've talked about that many times, but yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it can be good to set your sights on a certain place because I think that the job search can be really exhausting if you are just kind of throwing a dart at the at the uh, United States of America. Yeah. Um, but if there is a job that comes up and it looks appealing, then go for it no matter the location. And then you can work your way to like figuring out how to work in, in that place you want to be. But... You know, you were in at PetMate at Texas for how long? Two and a half years. Two and a half years. And then you moved to New York without a job. Yep. See, you know? I mean, even even as a, you know, two and a half years on my belt, I still couldn't get a job. Yeah. So Granted, I mean, I didn't, I, you know, I looked for a job for maybe three months and then stopped. But yeah, I think there's just, there's techniques to getting to getting to the place that you want to be at. And one of those techniques is just 
you know, focus in on a certain location, maybe even move there if you have the savings and, and, or take a trip out there if you right. can. Yeah. But, uh, that's, that's the contrary technique to my technique. Yeah. This is, Hey, it's a symphony of advice. But, uh, yeah, I just wanted to give, shoot that out there again. Cause I know that's a common, common question and common thought in a lot of yeah. students' minds. Um, and especially now that we have a bunch of grads and it's getting late summer. I'm yeah. Sure there's, I'm sure there's some anxious people out there for sure. Um, yeah, let's get to the next question. Next question from Zamoth 22 from the Narlock galaxy. <laughs> uh, my question is what would be a great storytelling structure when doing a presentation for assignments at uni? I thought this was a fun question just because, you know, we don't really, I mean, we talk about storytelling a little bit mm-hmm. probably on the past past podcast, but I thought this was kind of unique in that how do you how do you tell a story to your classmates? Right. Or you to your professor. Yeah. I, I'll tell you one one thing. Well, first of all, you can just generally tell the story of your process. Yeah. I mean that's that is an audience that is very interested in your process. Right. So, you know, talk about how you came up with the idea, you know, the the insights you found doing your research and things like that. Yeah. Um but uh, one trick that I always did in in presenting my final project was the reveal. Mm. And a lot of people, you know, it, it doesn't really, it's not like a common thing to think about, but it really does create an uh, engaging story. And what you do is you obviously bring up your final project in some sort of box or some sort of cloth. <laughs> cloth. No, it's, I mean, are you laughing now? I know this is like... I know this is like the Steve Jobs, like, oh, and this is the new product. Yeah. But but I am serious. Like it does. I mean, it yeah. does create like that anticipation. Did you anticipation. have a big question mark on no. the outside of the box? No, and it and a lot of times it was pretty crude. It like maybe it was just a piece of foam core that I had in front of my ladies and gentlemen <laughs> gather round for I am about to tell you a tale. Don't a tale make fun of my, of my <laughs> final shoe design. <laughs> no, but I I I do think. That when I presented projects in that way, I, I didn't do it until maybe the last year. I mm-hmm. kind of realized this technique. It really did get people excited. Mm. Because you tell this whole story. You build it up to this final point where you're like, and this is the final right. thing. And I mean, you know, we could dive into like the actual structure of the story where you do have the build up, the climax, and the, the conclusion. Is yeah. it called conclusion? Yeah, sure. And that's exactly what I did. If yeah. you show the climax at the beginning, you're like, hey, here's my product. Yeah. It's like, oh, okay. And then you talk about how you got there. People don't, people are going to zone out. Right. Yeah. That's, that's my tip. Do you, you have don't any wanna, story You don't want to climax early. So, Shames. I mean, the, you know, the thing is, is like when I was in school, I devised this, this technique that I haven't used since school, but I've been looking to figure out how to inject it into my professional life is I would take, because normally when people would put together slideshows for presentations, they'd be maybe like 20 slides maximum. Yeah. And they would spend maybe a minute on each slide. Okay. I changed my entire style my senior year, and I made slideshows that were 100 slides. Ooh. And I would do it like really rapid quick. fire. And I was literally illustrating every single thing that I was saying. Like sometimes very crudely, right? But it would just be an image for like every point that I was making, and so I never had to practice my presentations because you always had a prompt there. I knew exactly what I was saying, like you know, as I was going from slide to slide. I would, I just had this kind of like rhythm. That's cool. I like that. I like rapid fire presentations. And the the other thing that I adopted was the whole Bjork Ingalls, the big architecture firm, the way that they would explain their buildings, I thought was so ingenious. How did they, they explain it? They would be like, you know, here's our site. And then we, you know, extruded this cube out of it. But we wanted these people to be able to have this view. And so we twisted the building. Like, oh, you know, it's kind of like an evolution or like a, I don't know. Yeah. Everything would be step by step. Step by step. Um, but not necessarily step by step on on how they came up with the idea. More step by step on how the form how the form could be created. Right. In because a way. the thing is, is that it's so difficult sometimes to explain a form and right. why you arrived there. And you can just be like, well, you know, it's, it looks did good. All, I did all these studies <laughs> and it's uh, more ergonomic. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, nobody like 
like that's not a compelling story really right i'm trying to i'm trying to find a good example of like the way that they explain yeah, their we, we can always post a photo too oh man like let me just let me just see what they have here oh yeah this is a Man, I, I hit the jackpot on this one. So this is actually a building in New York. Right, this is a very and, angular building. Yeah, and so what they did was they, I remember they were talking about, they took the, the city block, the normal city block in right. New York, and the normal city block in Denmark, which is like around a courtyard, and they just, they mixed the two of them. Oh, interesting. And so they have, and now they have, in this presentation, they have this step-by-step -step of every single move that right. they made. And why it was important, like in terms of the lighting, in right. terms of the views for everybody. And it's a really simple way of explaining. It's so simple, but so effective. It's kind of like, you know, I, I think about this too when, when we talk about portfolios. I always, I always strive for that like three second image or set of images that just makes you understand the right. entire project. Yeah, like the, uh, like the Nendo yes, style. The Nendo sketch where they just have these little characters and they bring up, you know, however, however the project is. It's like you look at the, you look at the cartoon and you get it in three seconds. Yeah. And I feel like that's a common mistake too, is like people start on this journey of, you know, you don't even explain what you're designing. Like give someone three second overview of what you're designing. Right. Then go into your story and then reveal the final product and then, you know, wrap up the final details of the design. Yeah, for sure. So anyway, yeah, I think, um, there's a lot to, there's a lot to chew into. I think there's also I just think we like, had good tips. That was there's good also tips. just like figuring out, figuring out like what makes sense with your skill set. Yeah. Cause like for me, I was just interested in creating this, this imagery and for you, you were interested in this like model making, like making the box right, and right. you know, so like what makes sense with your skill set, and how can that aid your storytelling? Yeah. I will say it is good to practice the night before. I yes. know you said that you didn't have to practice yours, but I do definitely suggest practicing for sure, especially the night before, because there is something like with, with sleeping where you're your brain stores all that information. You yeah. can speak it much easily the day the day of. Right. So don't practice the morning of, practice the night before. Got it? Good. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Um should we shout out should we shout out someone for this week? Yes, we absolutely should. Uh and um the shout out the shout out this week is You found this guy, I, right? This is Well, this is, I think and I was just checking back. I'm pretty sure that Derek Cassio mentioned this guy during the podcast that we did with him, uh, the interview. Okay. And so this this person, Simon Williamson. Okay. He's a professor at Wentworth Institute of Technology, and, and his Instagram handle is at row underscore zero. Yes, and I think there's a whole philosophy around. I Connor. Um, Oh my gosh! Why am I why am I blanking on a name? See, James, this is why you shouldn't shout out names all the time. Oh no, You're blanking on names. Connor P.S. Right or yeah, Connor P.S. He was telling me about the whole philosophy of Row Zero, and I think it's about like always being a student. But, oh, that's interesting. Um, like always being at ground zero and yeah. learning no matter what. That's but cool. this this guy, and he's like a he is a veteran of industrial design. Like he is. You know he's an he's an elder, but the stuff that he generates on this his is, this is yeah Instagram is just spectacular. And I, I don't want to sound ageist here, but it's it's one of those things where you think that as you get older, you kind of get rusty with your skill set. Yeah, like this guy is at the top of the Instagram game right now. This this guy is really he's super engaged these in the some, software of the day. These are some crispy renders. Oh he, wait, what is this thing? Pull this up. It's like a oh yeah, it's like a watering a, can. Uh, I think it's, it kind of looks like an animal or something. It's. And he has all these handle studies with it. It's really nice. It's a nice, like, almost animal type of form with this this tail that right. looks like a handle. He's it could, got it could be like a watering can. Really awesome, Ooh, this like, is a futuristic watch concepts. That's really cool. And, yeah, he's obviously got 
a really great sense of working within both SolidWorks and KeyShot. Yeah. Because like the renders are great. The models are great. I mean, you can tell when you're looking at a KeyShot rendering whether the model underneath yeah. is any good or not. I feel I, I feel like when, when designers get older, they kind of slack off on a lot of things. But, right. But I hope that when I get older, this is what I'm doing. I, yeah. I am like at Prime and I am all up to date on all the the techniques and all You want to work at Prime Studios? No, no. I'm I at, know somebody. I'm, I'm just like <laughs> in my Prime. You know, I don't want to yeah. ever lose that. Um, but, but yeah, but check check him out. At, yeah. At row underscore zero. I'm pretty sure that he has a background in toy design or at least I think on his website it said something about being a model maker for toy companies, but also a toy inventor. There's definitely some playful objects There's, in here. It's very playful, but just like at the same time, very sophisticated. Um Definitely recommend checking out row underscore zero. Um, yeah, thanks for listening, guys. Uh, of course, you know, send us a send us a, a question if you have it. Send us your thoughts on the Discord. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Discord is in our bio on Instagram, and the Instagram is at Minor Details Pod. If you haven't followed that, yeah. Um, hey, I've been thinking we need, we got to get the the iTunes up a little bit more. Oh yeah. So if you guys are listening to this right now. Go to your iTunes podcast app and rate that thing five stars. Add a little note, too. Just give your thoughts on what this podcast means to you. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, I can't believe we made it through this episode, man. I'm starting to su- I'm sweat. Yeah, it's pretty sweaty it's in here. So here. Spotify, YouTube, also on YouTube. If you're a YouTuber, if you like to, to take in the podcast that way, there's a notification bell you should right. click. Ring That'll the bell. tell you when the new. Press the subscribe button. Yeah, smash that like button. <laughs> Uh, leave a comment. Um, but yeah. Uh, intro and outro is by Kiyoshi the Kid. It is. And uh, yeah, as always, I'm at Nicky B. Baker. And I'm at I Draw and Receipts. Peace out. Later. <laughs>